As we discussed last week, the motions of the planets gave astronomers a lot of trouble. First, it was the first thing we discussed about this was the the uh, Ptolemaic model of the solar system from the geocentric perspective, where he had to come up with this convoluted uh, set of epicycles and offset circles in order to explain what the planets were doing. Um, and then we showed last week that things transitioned over to a heliocentric viewpoint, where the sun is at the center, and the motions of the planets made a lot more sense from that perspective. But there was still a desire to go a little bit deeper, and so the first thing we're going to talk about this week is Kepler's laws of planetary motion. The process of science leads us to continuously revise our models. So you should never think of a theory as an endpoint. It's always the best explanation we have for something, given the data that we have at that point. It's been tested, it works. But it's rarely an end. In fact, it's probably safe to say it's never an end. No theory is ever the final theory. There's always going to be something that replaces it. It does a little bit better job than the one before. Um, that's not to say that the earlier theory was wrong. It was just a model that was due to be updated. For instance, the geocentric model. Everything that we talked about in the geocentric model was really, really useful. And they helped people to advance and, and understand the sky uh, in a much better way. But the Earth wasn't at the center, and so when the data got more and more precise, we're able to see that, that the geocentric model needed to be updated, and the heliocentric model came in to replace it. Now we can confirm that one aspect of the heliocentric model is objectively true. The Earth is going around the Sun. But there's a lot more that goes into these models than just then that one basic fact, what's at the center. In fact, later on, we might even throw that up um, into a little bit of upheaval because what do we mean by center? Uh, when you start thinking about the universe as a whole, uh, where's the center of the universe? We can ask that kind of a question. But back to the heliocentric model specifically, uh, there's the basic fact of what's at the center of the solar system, and then there's the details of how it all works from there. Um, and I want to look at two questions specifically. Can planetary motion be described mathematically? Can you put an equation that tells you exactly how the planets are moving around the sun? And then the second one, which is maybe more interesting, uh, at least to a lot of you, what causes the planets to orbit the sun? What's making them move? So Kepler was focused mainly on the first question. He was a mathematician. Um, he's pictured here on the right. And he was determined to understand planetary motion from a mathematical perspective. He wanted to know what's the shape of these orbits, the speed, how fast they're moving around, um, what explains the relative distances, why are they where they are in orbit around the sun. There must be some reason. Now, he was also very religious, and so he assumed that God had designed the universe with a purpose and that that purpose would be revealed in, in studying how the, the planets were oriented in the solar system. So the way I've said it here on the slide is what's the celestial architecture of the solar system. But he couldn't do this by himself. He was a, largely a mathematician, and he relied on the data from observations. And the person who had the best observational data was a very wealthy man by the name of Tycho Brahe. And he had an observatory, although he didn't use a telescope. Telescopes were around, but his observatory was what was pictured on the, on the left-hand picture. Uh, that's him sitting in a chair, which is built on this uh, rotating swivel that uh, is in a room with no windows besides one opening for light to come in from the sky. And so he could position himself 
looking at one particular point in the sky and record exactly what the orientation of that was. And with this, with this tool, he was able to make very precise measurements, the most precise measurements at the time, of where the planets were and when they were there. He held on to that data. He didn't let just anybody have it. Um, he was very sociable. He liked to have big gatherings. He liked to have big crowds. And he took Kepler in. Kepler lived in his estate um, and gave him bits and pieces of data slowly over time. Uh, eventually, Kepler got enough of the data to piece together what was really happening with the planets. So after studying that observational data, he discovered three laws of planetary motion. The first is that the orbits are ellipses with the sun at one focus. We'll talk about what that, both of those words mean, ellipses and focus. Uh, the planets, number two, planets sweep out equal areas in equal times in their orbits around the sun. That the square of the orbital period is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis of the orbit. So I don't expect you to read those and know exactly what each one of them means. So we're going to unpack them one at a time. So the first law. An ellipse is, so first of all, in general, about the shape an ellipse. It's uh, one of the conic sections, which means it's a slice of a cone. So here we have pictured a cone. And you can slice a cone in different ways. If you slice it horizontally, you get a circle. If you slice it at an angle, you get an ellipse. And if that angle is steep enough, you will either get a parabola or a hyperbola. Okay. It turns out that orbits or paths of, of planets or moons or asteroids or comets are all one of these shapes. So the circle and the ellipse are what we refer to as, this is sort of an aside, uh, circle and ellipse are what we refer to as bound orbits. They're going around and around in this shape or this shape. Parabola or hyperbola are unbound orbits. So you can imagine coming from very far away, swinging around the sun and then heading back out into space. And the same for the hyperbola. We're not going to do much with these two types of trajectories. Uh, but we'll focus in on the circles and the ellipses. Kepler found that ellipses actually fit the shape of the orbits better than circles. So they aren't perfectly round. The, the planet's distance from the sun is changing uh, slightly, or not so slightly, depending on the case, uh, throughout the course of its year, its trip around the sun. Now, a little bit more about an ellipse. An ellipse has two focus points, and they are on either side of the center. And the significance of those focus points, it, it takes a little bit to explain what this means, but I think you'll get the idea, uh, especially thinking about it visually, uh, using this picture here on the right. So imagine putting two thumbtacks into a piece of cardboard and then taking a string a loop of string, and stretching it out with a pencil in this way. Then you've got a triangle, right? Now the perimeter of the string is always going to be the same because it's the same string. But depending on where you move the pencil, the shape that it outlines will be different. And so the ellipse is actually the shape that you create when you take this string and you draw it around the circle or draw it around the loop. You get that ellipse. And so the focus is the, the, um, each focus is significant because they are geometrically related to the shape of the ellipse. The further the focus points get from the center and the more oblong the shape is going to be. If you bring the focus points towards the center, you're getting a more and more circular object. If you're interested, you can just try this. Take two thumbtacks and a string of paper and a pencil, a string of rope or string, and a, uh, a pencil, and you can sketch out different shaped ellipse just by moving the focal points to either closer to the center or further apart. Well, what Kepler found with the precision data that he got from Tycho Brahe was that the sun 
was located at one of those focus points and the planet moved in an ellipse around it. Okay, so you can imagine the sun is here and then this is the orbit. All right, we'll see later on exactly what the orbits look like. None of them are this stretched out, at least for the planets themselves. But that's what he found. The planetary orbits are not circles, they're ellipses, and the sun is at one focus of the ellipse. On to the second law. If you diagram one of the orbits and you get an ellipse shape like this, uh, you can imagine the planet moving around the ellipse. Now, as it's moving around, you can say it's sweeping out area inside the ellipse. So, let's say point A. It moves from here to here. It sweeps out this triangle, or what's almost a triangle, uh, inside the ellipse. Moving around point B, going from here to here, it sweeps out this area of the triangle. So that's what Kepler means by sweeps out the area. Well, what he found was that the area that it sweeps out is the same if the time interval is the same. So if the time going from here to here is, let's say, a day, then the time going from here to here would be a day, as long as these areas are equal. Okay. Now this sort of seems like a odd fact, right? It's a mathematical oddity that this would be true, that the areas would be the same if the times were the same. But there's a very important qualitative observa observation to make about this, which is that in order for the area of these two triangles to be the same when the times are the same, this triangle needs to be long and skinny, whereas this one needs to be short and wide. short meaning short from here to here and wide from here to here right that's the only way this can work because this point is closer to the sun and this point is farther from the sun so the the distance that it travels in its orbit around point a is shorter than the distance it travels around point b but the time intervals are the same so if the distances are different but the times are the same the qualitative point that's important to remember here is that the speeds are different. The planet actually has to be moving faster through point B than it is through point A. Okay, and so that's another way to think of Kepler's second law, that planets move faster when they're closer to the sun and slower when they're farther away. Third law. If you take the, uh, the second law to its logical conclusion, uh, and extend that to the whole orbit itself, you can compare the orbits of different planets. Planets that are closer to the sun would be moving faster. Planets that are farther away from the sun would be moving slower. Well, if that's true, then the period of the orbit, the time it takes to complete an orbit, is going to be shorter for the planets that are in close to the sun and longer for the planets that are farther away from the sun. Now, so you could say that qualitatively, but Kepler was able to quantify this. And this is also known as the law of harmony. It, it shows a harmonic balance between the period of the orbit and what's called the semi-major axis. Because this is an ellipse, the distances are changing at every point in the ellipse distance from the sun, right? So here it's this distance, here it's this distance. The distance from the sun is changing. So how can you quantify the size of the orbit? Well, you can use the axis, the long axis, and then cut it in half. We call that the semi-major axis. So the distance from here to here would be the major axis. The semi-major just means half of the major axis. You could probably guess that this is the minor axis of the ellipse, and so the distance from here to here would be the semi-minor axis. But we're, we're only interested in the semi-major axis. It characterizes the, the size of the orbit for us. And it has this nice mathematical relationship with the period. So you square the period, and that will be equal to this cube of the semi-major axis. 
Now we can see that for the uh, orbit of Jupiter. Its period is 11.86 years. So if you square that, you get 140.66. And its semi-major axis is 5.20 AU. If you cube that, you get 140.61, and those are about the same, which verifies for us this relationship. When you square the period, it's equal to the cube of the semi-major axis. And what Kepler found is that relationship is true for all of the planets that he could measure. And it is true for, for all of the planets. And any, any object that's orbiting the sun will display this relationship right here. Okay, so I think that's it for uh, Kepler's laws. We will return to talk about um, why these laws are true in the next video when we, when we introduce the contributions of Isaac Newton.